Welcome into the KSO Show. I am Mason Voth. That is Derek Young, and we are here on a Friday, like always, to preview the upcoming K-State football game, which this weekend it happens to be against the Arizona State Sun Devils. Both teams come into the game at 7-2 and two and 4-2 and two in Big 12 play, so both would realistically like to hope that they still have a shot to be involved in the Big 12 title race, but this is basically an elimination game for these two teams that again, are hoping that Colorado drops a game somewhere along the way. And I don't know, tiebreaker-wise, if that would have any impact in a good way for Arizona State. There's might be a little bit more delicate, but we'll uh, worry about all that when we have to get to it down the road. Before we get started, I want to remind everybody that K-State getting ready to head overseas and play in Ireland to start next season. So everybody get excited for that. And you can join your Wildcats in Ireland as they kick off the 2025 football season against Iowa State in the Aer Lingus College Football Classic. Game tickets can be secured now through a travel or hospitality package. All-inclusive travel packages include premium game tickets, luxury hotel accommodations, and exclusive K-State welcome experience and more. Game day hospitality packages include premium in-stadium hospitality with food and drinks and premium game tickets. Don't miss out on the trip of a lifetime. Book your package now at cats2ireland.com. That's cats, the number two, ireland.com. All right, so you have a team there. They've got a shade of red as their color. Let's flip it to a different team with some red, more maroon. The Arizona State Sun Devils are an interesting team because last year they were not very good, but it was Kenny Dillingham's first year. He was cleaning up a monstrous mess left behind by the Herm Edwards era at Arizona State, which uh, in some ways directly involved uh, a a certain guy that Arizona State fans really hate right now. And I saw a funny tweet regarding that uh, recently. But Antonio Pierce was on staff when Herm Edwards was there, and he's the guy that got them into some trouble, which you're probably thinking, wait, Arizona, what's the connection there for – Antonio Pierce, yeah, he played at the University of Arizona, but was on staff at ASU under Herm Edwards, completely wrecked the program, and then left them with some NCAA violations. And now Antonio Pierce is somehow an NFL head coach. And uh, I know ASU fans are reveling in the fact that the Raiders are 2-7 and right now with him leading the way. But Kenny Dillingham is a different beast. And one of the major moves he made last season was bringing Cam Scadaboo in at running back a transfer from Sacramento State. This year, they get Sam Levitt to come in and play quarterback for him, and that has really changed things. They're just a more competent team, and they found ways to win games and take care of business against really bad ones. And K-State will have to be ready uh, on Saturday night because in some ways, this is a team that's going to be pretty similar to K-State. Arizona State wants to run the ball, and their defense is really good at stopping the run, just like K-State. Yeah, Uh now, I have a lot of respect for Arizona State, the way that they're getting things done. They're winning a lot of close games. They're, I think all seven wins are by a touchdown or less, to be quite honest. I don't think they've ever gotten away from anyone. Um, losses to Tech and Cincinnati. They just kind of take care of their business the right way. Uh, they play like a mature team. You said competent. That sounds about right. They have a just a winning football approach. My questions about them are probably more schedule based than anything. Uh, they haven't beaten any power four team with a winning record. I think the only team with a winning record that they have defeated was Texas State, and that was not by a lot of points. Um, there, some of their rush defense numbers, as you said, look good, but they've also haven't played a ton of good rushing offenses. And when they did, they were exploited, <laughs> exploited, excuse me, RJ Harvey ran all over them last week and Devin Neal. Now didn't get the ball enough with only 12 or 13 carries, I believe, but Devin Neal ran for over five yards a carry. So when they do face a little bit more stiffer competition, you can see their numbers tend to dip, whether that be against good running backs from KU and UCF, though they still won that game or losing to Cincinnati and Texas tech. So I, I don't know. I, I have respect for Arizona State and what they have done this year. Um, and if you would have told me before the season they would be, what is it, uh, six and two or seven and seven, two? Seven right? and two. Seven and two right now, it would have blown me away. So I'm still blown away by what they have done. But 
when now that I have the context of what some of those teams have become, um, a little less impressed, but they should still be proud of what they have done, considered what they have went through, what they are still dealing with, and it being rather a young program, um, at least uh, under Kenny Dillingham, who is a young football coach as well, with a bright, bright future and doing well for his alma mater. I think what if there is one thing that really scares me about this game, if I'm Kansas State, it is that Cam Scadaboo is the type of back that can really give them problems because in the past two years when it just felt like things got away from Kansas State in some certain games, it's because a back has just ran through arm tackle after arm tackle after arm tackle. And uh, that's the bread and butter for Cam Scadaboo. Yeah, and there's also the added element that he's going to be involved in the passing game because he's a second-leading receiver for Arizona State. Um, they don't have a ton of guys that are going to be overly involved when it comes to the ball being in the air. In fact, if you look at their their top three receivers on the season, there's Jordan Tyson, who we, we should note has been really, really good for them. He's caught almost 50 passes this year for 650 yards, seven touchdowns. He's been really good. He was a Colorado transfer that left after Dion got there, ended up at ASU, but then it's Scadaboo and then their tight end who has just 200 receiving yards on the year and 22 grabs. Big drop-off after that uh, in their receiving game. So it really is, what can Cam Scadaboo do for us? And that really sets up everything else that Arizona State does with their offense. Uh, and then you, you look at, like you mentioned, the schedule is something to note and to think about what are you getting here. Arizona State can beat K-State if K-State doesn't take care of their business and doesn't do what we would expect of them. But this is one of those games where home game against a team that you should be better than, you have to win this game if you're K-State. And we talk about the schedule variance this year, and we've noted how difficult K-State's schedule has been. You look at Arizona State's, the only team that they've played, well, I guess you give credit to Cincinnati now. Cincinnati is still above 500. Um, but there are two losses in Big 12 play, like you said. They're, so the only teams that are above 500 – uh, that they've played in the conference, and it's Texas Tech and Cincinnati. Now, those were games on the road, uh, and then their home schedule, they've had a four-point win against KU. That was when KU was still reeling. And let's put it let's put it accurately, that's their best win this year. Yeah, you're probably right. You're probably right. And then they beat Utah by eight. Utah was already on. Well, that was actually the game where they tried having Cam Rising play when he was – yeah, awesome. so they actually got the worst version of Utah because they got to play against that one. Yeah, I don't know. I think I think a, a life support Cam Rising is better than anything else they've tried at quarterback this year. Uh, I, well, maybe, but well, the the kid last week was all right for Utah. Uh, uh, well, and, yeah, and then they made him play with like uh, in a situation where he probably shouldn't have. Like now he's having season-ending surgery. Uh, so a lot of questions for the Utah athletic department right now. A lot of them. Yeah. Uh, they blew out Oklahoma State, who has gotten blown out by everybody this year. And then last week, uh, just a four-point win at home against UCF. Now, that, again, Scadaboo was not in that game. And you look at, in the last three weeks, their shakiest performances, the loss at Cincinnati and the win against UCF. At Cincinnati, Sam Levitt did not play. That was a Jeff Sims game. They lose 24-14. to 14. And then last week against UCF, no Cam Scadaboo. So things are a little bit different. Um, and they found themselves in a tight one uh, with UCF late, and Arizona State scored the go-ahead uh, touchdown with about five minutes left in that game. So this is not – not all seven and two teams are created equally. I think most people know that and understand that, but Arizona State really paints that picture in a pretty clear way. Even though I think they are a, a good football team, they just – if you stack them up to how K-State has played – this should favor K-State, and that's why K-State's an eight-and-a-half-point favorite at home against a team that has the same record as them. Three things here. Uh, I don't know how Arizona State scored as many points as they did last week when you look at the offensive numbers because their offensive numbers dipped a lot without Scadaboo. So some people were like, man, they look they look at the score like they were fine without Scadaboo. You, know, you look deeper into the numbers, there were some issues. Two, Arizona State has told us exactly who they are this year. They will beat the bad teams and lose to everybody else. And they're like, well, that they're seven and two. Yeah, they haven't played many non-bad teams this year, so that that just is what it is. And then the third one is kind of what me and you touched on a while ago. Now I'll admit it's taken a little bit while to get there. 
but you just alluded to it in the last couple of games. It seems like they're running a little bit out of gas. Which that happens with teams that are kind of new so, to all this. And you think about the pieces that they're having to use, like yep, yep. Sam Levitt, this is his first real crack at this thing. Like he's he is a, a sophomore quarterback. Um, and he played, and you go and look at, at last season as a freshman, he played in four games for Michigan State. He threw 23 passes last year. Um, the style that they play lends themselves to having to deal with injuries and guys being banged up at significant spots. And we know that everybody this time of the year is, but obviously in the last three games, their starting quarterback and their running back, their two best players have had to miss time or most important players. I think Tyson would probably be up there with Scadaboo as their two best. So there's that to watch for in this game. A couple of other notes on Arizona State just for people to kind of keep in mind and how everything ends up uh, working out here. Um, I, I want to note on Scadaboo, there's really no rhyme or reason to when he's had his good and bad games this year. His worst game, his two worst games of the season have come against teams that are like middle of the pack in Big 12 run defense, and his best games have come against some of the league's best uh, defensively. So it really is more about Cam Scadaboo will dictate how this goes. I know we don't want to talk about basketball today, um, but he's like a, a more consistent version of Cam Carter where you're probably going to know early if it's his night, and you're probably not going to be able to do anything about it. And that's how I would look at that. Defensively, uh, for Arizona State, would note on this as well, talked about the run defense. They're the third best in the Big 12 behind K-State, about 3.6 yards a carry. Um, names to know, Miles Rouser, one of their defensive backs. And then they have two defensive linemen up front that will try and wreck things, and Clayton Smith and Jacob Rich can Geica. And then Caleb McCullough is probably um, one of their better players on defense, along with Keith Abney. McCullough's a linebacker. Abney's uh, – a DB. So those are some of the things to know. They haven't forced that many turnovers this year, though. Um, they're middle of the pack in picks in the league, and then they've only forced two fumbles all season. So you don't have to uh, hopefully worry about a weird DJ or Avery fumble that we've seen at different points this season that seem uncharacteristic. And probably the most important thing to know going into this game is that they are the worst kicking team in the Big 12. Kenny Dillingham made that very clear after their loss to Cincinnati when he called for walk-on tryouts the following week at kicker. They are 50% on their field goals this year at 7 of 14. And their kicker, Ian Hershey, on kicks beyond 30 yards. This is not like, oh, 40-plus. This is 30-plus. From 30 yards and out, Ian Hershey is 3 of 8 this season with a long of 47 yards. And last I checked, there's a little bit of wind in the forecast on Saturday uh, in Manhattan. So we'll see how that goes. They're also one of the worst punting teams in the Big 12 with K-State, depending on which numbers you end up looking at yeah, there. Yeah, K-State is, uh, kind of gets the benefit of the doubt on some of those special teams metrics when it comes to punting, just because I think, regardless, obviously is shanked more than we would want to see. But I think what has helped – McLean in with some of his numbers and you can correct me if I'm wrong I think he has downed a fair amount inside the 20 yes yeah it's he's a he's a very boomer bust type of punter like it, now his offense hasn't helped him out he's had a lot of punts recently where his offense has been pretty backed up they got to do a better job of It'd giving nice. opportunities but when it, you're in those there have been some borderline shanks this season too so I think everybody's culpable in why K-State's punting has been so bad yeah and I know Fan has uh, harped on this, and I've been harping on this, and I don't think it's being talked about enough just generally in the Kansas State universe. But, like, the <laughs> the field position uh, category, battle, whatever you want to call it, the net of just where Kansas State's average starting field position is compared to their opponents that they play, whew, um, pretty sure it's almost last in the country. And that's a really like hidden number that tends to play a large factor when the when the yardage difference is like 10, 15. I mean, yeah. you're basically being forced to get one or two more first downs than your opponent. That's that's a big deal. Um, and when you are getting whacked around so much 
in that singular facet, um, regardless of the opponent, it makes it kind of almost a stunning development that they're even seven at two, just because they are getting smoked so much. Now, so there were a few games that made that number probably uh, exaggerated a little bit, especially BYU, but boy, it's rough. Yeah, it's pretty bad. I mean, you think about looking at some of the game, the two losses for K-State, that's been a big deal. BYU obviously had as short a field position as you could have asked for. And then you look at the Houston, Houston game. Yeah. Basically, every time Houston scored Midfield. outside of the, the last touchdown run by Chris, they were getting the ball in a really nice spot. And then you think of how backed up K-State always was in that game. Houston's uh, longest scoring drive was 56 yards. So all of their drives were that way. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, even some of the other games, Colorado early on, you think of why Colorado was able to have success. Mm -hmm. They were getting short fields. K-State was really backed up. Uh, the the K-State offense in those situations, some of this is on them. They're not helping themselves out with the punting situation, well, but they're having to get work over. extra hard. You know, uh, yeah, it's, it's a mess there. Yeah. But because I don't think kids say it's a huge turnover problem from an offensive standpoint, but if you think about their turnovers this far in the season, a, a, a chunk of them, like they're in one way or another, it's setting up the defense with a, like Avery's turned the ball over a few times inside his own, like 20, 25 yard line. That's just crippling. Yeah, they, you're right. There is, a, it's not a turnover problem that they have, but, Boy, the ones that they make have been mighty costly this season. Um, either in the neighborhood of giving instant points, basically, to your opponent or yep. taking points from yourself away like Avery did against KU when he fumbled at, like, the 25-yard line. And then the BYU was the scoop and score, too. So that was a bad turnover. Yep. Avery had that bad turnover right before the half and right after the half. Um Avery almost threw a pick six against Colorado, but the guy got bit by the turf monster. Yep. So, and then and in, a, in a situation where K State was driving to try and put the game away. Yep. Uh, so, yeah, there's a, a lot there. All right. We've, we've shifted to the K State side of this. So, I will ask you here um, what do you think the likelihood is that K State bounces back and what, what needs to look better for you this week? Because I think there's been a little bit of an overreaction of trying to make one loss against Houston stand above everything else that's gone on this season. Um, look, teams will play bad games, and when you're on the road and then you have the bad weather element thrown into it, anything can really happen there. K-State should have handled it better. They played like crap. They have to own that, and they, you know, they don't deserve excuses for that game, but they also don't deserve to have that Houston game define the rest of the year. Uh, that's perfectly said. Um... I understand, and I won't even call it an overreaction because it's probably justified. I'll say reaction to the Houston game and why so many have kind of just like rolled their eyes and wanted to extrapolate that further because it feels like that kind of loss in that kind of situation has sort of been too frequent under Chris Kleiman. And obviously, when you consider how they lost that game, who they lost it to, and 7-1 and playing for a Big 12 championship, it just causes so many to view that a little bit more harshly than they would otherwise. So I don't really wouldn't call it an overreaction because it can't happen in that situation, but it does. And, and to those that say there's always one of those a year, in ways, yes, but also when you do some reflection, some of those teams just end up being good, right? Because we thought everyone said that yeah, after losing I mean, to BYU, and now they're – nine and oh and another thing and you know last year it's like well it was iowa state well was, was iowa state that much worse than k-state last year k-state was an eight and four team iowa yeah. state was seven and five and i mean tulane and, in 2022 and, well, they won tulane, the and then people were like that after they lost at mizzou last year mizzou also win went on to win the cotton bowl so it's like yeah also, and, and another uh, before i because i don't want to forget what yeah. i was gonna say every team that's not in the top five typically has a game like that exactly there i mean yeah it's Unless you are one of those Alabama lost to Vanderbilt, uh, yeah, high end teams, and Vanderbilt is Ole Miss lost to Kentucky. Those yeah. two will probably play in the playoff, and they lost to Kentucky and Vanderbilt. Yeah, it's there's there's a variance, and most teams at the top in college football typically do not have it. This year, we've seen a little bit more of it. Um, but you're right. You think about it with K State, like 
Colorado lost to Nebraska. Just because a loss is disappointing doesn't necessarily mean that it's something that should never happen. Look, K State should not have lost the game to Houston, but in the big picture, grand scheme of things, a loss like that is eventually going to happen because you have to also consider the other end where Chris Kleiman has delivered a lot of other wins that, in theory, should not be likely. K State yeah. should not have beaten Oklahoma in 2019 or 2020. They should not have beaten TCU in the Big 12 title game. Like, you can go through the list of wins that Chris Kleiman and K-State have delivered in situations where they probably shouldn't have versus, you know, the, the losses that, yeah, they're, they're frustrating. But some of the ones that people would point out, Tulane, Cotton Bowl champs, Missouri, Cotton Bowl champs. The Iowa State game last year, yep, probably shouldn't have lost to them. But also, again, with the snowstorm aspect, same thing with Houston, the, the rain, all that. Houston's you have to be trouble. tougher. I will say that. You have to be tougher. Like, I, I question the toughness yeah. of these teams under Chris Klein in the last two years now because of what we've seen in their disastrous losses. BYU, like you talked about. Their Arkansas State ran. with COVID. Um, yeah. The um, COVID I, I sh- shouldn't even be worried about. And then 2020, yeah. Black Friday against Texas in 21, it's like, you were on your backup quarterback. That was bad, Will Howard. You fired Messingham after the game. So, like, Chris ch- Kleiman, and, and both teams were kind of checked out, I thought, in that game. Yeah. It was, uh, yeah, but, I mean, that game counts, sure. The the worst one is probably Houston because yep, I especially is. take a little bit of issue with the Iowa State one last year. I'm like, Kansas State was one game better than Iowa State. Look at the records, 8-4, and 7-5. and five. Like, yeah, it, you, the way it happened, inexcusable. But it's not like that was the dud of the year based on opponent. Either. Yeah, you lost seven points to a team that was semi comparable. Yeah, this year Houston, uh, I, I will say I count that up there because they could have coached and managed that game to a yes. win. Yep, especially yeah. in the circumstance yeah. where they lost the game from to the I end. Thought was, I thought it was game management. Yep, yep. But, and but to your point, that's why I'm not like saying that Houston game is reflective of what's to come. I really don't think so. Kids, they typically plays really, really well after a loss. And, and again, they're back at home. They've been really, really good at home yeah. in the last year and a half, two years. And again, it, I not, not to take anything away from Arizona state or like n- disrespect them, but the way this season has gone for them and this being the first team in the big 12 in the top six that they have played this year, that still has two losses or less in the league. I tend to think this is the recipe where this is because every team usually gets their doors blown off of them one time. Yeah. This season. If they're not a top 10 team, they're getting their doors blown off once in case they got their doors blown off yep. of BYU. Colorado got their doors blown off against Nebraska. Let's, yeah. let's, let's be honest. It happens to almost every non-top 10 team. It has not happened to Arizona State yet. That might just not happen, and it's a product of Kenny Dillingham being a hell of a coach. But if it's going to happen, this game kind of has that formula to me. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree with you on that one 100%. And you, you look at the last couple of years at home with K-State and Chris Kleiman. They've been really good, and basically if you aren't uh, – a top 10 team or whatever um, they've handled you in a pretty nice way. I mean, KU is the exception this season for the most part, but Arizona and Oklahoma state got blasted this year. Um, You go back to last year until the Iowa state game, you didn't see a close game in Manhattan last year. TCU. Yeah. Yeah. Um, It wasn't. And then you go back the year prior to that, it was, yeah. Baylor got blown out in, in 23, but then 22, yeah, they lost at home to Texas in a one-score game, but oh, you know they beat KU by that. Still ended up being like twenty-some points. Twenty. Um, they they blew out Oklahoma State. Forty-eight. Like, yeah, yeah, forty-eight. That's an easy one to remember there. So <laughs> they have been pretty good, and I would also say this because, like you're talking, you want to make sure Arizona State gets their respect. Like this is not to kind of poo-poo them, but. This should be a testament to where Chris Kleiman has things at K-State right now, and it's that basically every game that is on their schedule, it feels like I repeat this every week, and it's because I truly believe it. As long as K-State takes care of themselves, I'm not trying to kill them there with my misspeak like Brian Kelly, um, I, if K-State takes care of themselves under Chris Kleiman, they typically should and will win the game. Like most of the time when they lose, 
he has this program in a position where they did it to themselves. They did it to themselves in Houston. It's Houston did nothing to them. They did it to themselves in Provo this year. And then you look at the games that they have won this season. Like that was them having some errors and getting their crap together and going out and making sure they didn't lose the game. And you can go back a couple of years now and realize that this is the case. Like Iowa State last year, why do we always bring it up? It's because how they played against Iowa State in that game was inexcusable on defense. And then you can go through all the others and and like look at the game. Um, I you know Texas doesn't necessarily count there because they were a way better team. Obviously now with uh, Malik Murphy yeah. playing quarterback, I don't yeah. know uh, where you grade that. But like even that game, uh, that was K State beat themselves in that one in points. So that is what people should also consider when thinking about the setup that K-State has right now. Um, I guess final question for you. You don't think Chris Kleiman or anybody needs to be fired right now then? That's what it no. sounds like? Yeah. No, nobody. Uh, okay. You're not You're not – seven to two teams, I will say this, seven to two teams don't fire coaches midseason, folks. Yeah, and I know that there's been a lot of talk right now about what expectations and everything should be uh, for K-State. Like at the end of the day – a conversation for a different day too. Yeah, yeah. it's just you're, you are you got to let the season fully play out before you have those conversations. But There, there, there is some diagnosing that we can do for a show that would be very fun and very interesting, but I also think we need more results. Yeah. There's, there's a, there is a, a path to an off season show where it's like, okay, the program is this, but it looks like there are these little fixes that can make it be this. So yeah, well, that's uh for another time. All right, let's uh, take a break from the K state ASU talk, dive into best bets. And we didn't have a show last week on Friday. So these are our, results from the week prior when k-state lost at houston and everything else went on not a great week uh for us dy went one one and one baylor <laughs> saved him with a push a push the baylor minus three against uh tcu that was I, to, to be honest like that that was kind of a like a a disappointing push because that bet felt like the right bet almost the entire game so i, yeah. I felt I will say just on my own with my own money, obviously, uh, you know, in the books because it's legal in Kansas now. Uh, I had a good week last week, so I wish we would have. Yeah, I know. It was, you, you you hurt yourself there. Uh, all right. Well, here, here, here back pain, I think. Yeah. Here is uh, this week with the just rousing uh, battle <laughs> going on. My unders, neither of them had a chance. Or no, one hit easy. Yeah. The other one didn't have a chance. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, shout out to Oregon. They've been a horse for me all season. And then Clemson, I try to start giving Dabo some credit again, and uh, they just uh, yeah. fell on their face. And uh, if you think that I'm done riding the Illini, you're wrong. I'm back Sparty. this week. Look at uh, so, look, I I went all Big Ten this week. Some pretty disgusting Big Ten games. I, I, I got I – got, I'm kind of – I'll be honest. I didn't love the board this week. There's not – there was great. no – there, there was a lot of big numbers out there. There wasn't well, like SEC usually there's four or five week. games. I'm like, I am betting this game. I didn't find that this week. All right. Well, for me, uh, I'm starting the party tonight with Washington on Friday. If you're watching this, or if you're taking this in on Saturday before the game gets going, um, then you're going to know who they play, who we play. Uh, they play UCLA. At uh, home tonight, a little Friday what, night on Fox. I, I I like the bet, but the Bruins have been surprisingly competitive this yeah, year. Yeah, they're finding themselves right now. But I, you know, Washington helped yeah. out against USC at home, so I'm thinking, uh, what do you you know? They're going to get this thing done. Yeah. Uh, Ohio State. I've got Will Howard there. They are playing at Wrigley Field this yeah. weekend against Northwestern. Will Howard three plus touchdown pass. Last I checked, it was plus one twenty two. In Ohio State's last three games against teams that weren't the number three team in the country at the time, which was you know Penn State and Oregon, uh, Will Howard has thrown at least three touchdown passes. So I'm thinking he has a nice and tidy big day quickly in Wrigley. And, they have no and then Devin Brown's probably finishing the game. Yeah, and they have no reason to run him against Northwestern. So that'll also help you. Why why, why uh, flirt with disaster there when you're playing Northwestern? Uh, you like you did. Did mention what would scare me is not enough possessions for Will. He might only get on the field for six drives and he's, he's done. I'm not worried about it. 
Uh, <laughs> I think he's going to go out there and, and deliver here. Uh, and then, I mean, I guess if you want to be soft, you can take the two touchdowns. That's fine. That'll be all right. Um, <laughs> at, I did that against Penn State, and it worked out for me. Uh, okay. Illinois, I'm back on them. You know I can't quit my Illini. Uh, I've been brainwashed by Alec Bussey, but they are minus two and a half at home against Michigan State. See, I, I I try not to bet games where Michigan State is in because all hell breaks loose. It's They're weird. Like, yeah. Um, I want UL Monroe having a good season. That's a big number. Hawks. 25. And they're playing Auburn. Like, we, I don't know. Auburn is, the, the, they, what, they got whooped by Cal this year. Like, for Auburn to be laying 25, even against a, a group of five team that has a pretty good record is kind of weird to me. And the fact that didn't Auburn lose to New Mexico State in the spot last year? Yes, uh, Diego Pavia. Yeah, yeah so I'll take you all Monroe in a point. It on, a, on a day where I didn't see a lot of games I loved, that one seems like a, a kind of a gimme. So because I said that. It'll I mean, probably... that feels like a game that in the fourth quarter, it's going to be like 13 to six or something. Yeah, so I like that. So it sounds like you're going to um, you're going to. I'll tell you. Yeah, you're going to tell me. Tennessee plus nine and a half. I. I I think Nico's going to play, and I have, I kind of have questions about Georgia this year. Not questions like, oh, are they broken? But questions like, uh, I think you might be the borderline playoff team that yeah. the thinks you are. To me, if if Nico plays and you know the the offense is just good not enough for Tennessee, sensational, but yeah, but the defense for Tennessee has been really good this year, and Carson Beck has looked really, really yeah, bad. Gonna, if anything about Georgia's broken, it's Carson Beck. Yeah, which again, you know, red flags here uh, on the Carson Beck front. I, I point this out. Um, I I worked in Wichita at a radio station that was a Fox Sports affiliate, so we had Colin Cowherd on for three hours in the middle of the day. Colin loved to talk about quarterback face, and he's just like quarterbacks. They all have a look to them. All the good ones have a look to them. Um, very rarely do you see one that you go, mm, that, that guy looks like a linebacker or an offensive lineman. Uh, Carson Beck does not have quarterback face, but the biggest red flag of all, and I take this from the basketball side of things, what arm does Carson Beck throw with, D.Y.? Right. Bingo. Uh, do you know which arm Carson Beck has all tatted up? Is it his right? It's his right arm. Um, think of great shooters in basketball history. Do you know what handedness J.J. Redick was? Right. Do you know what arm he had all tatted up? Was it left? It was his left because uh, shooters don't mess with their shooting arm. Oh, and okay. so you, you red have... flag to me that Carson Beck – Leaves you, the left this arm. Would, this should be like a sports science episode or something. I would I would love this, but that you're gonna, you know, not touch the left arm, the one you don't need, but then the right one, the one you're slinging things with, you're putting, you know, random stuff, random ink or whatever into your arms. Yeah. A red flag to me. That's a guy that doesn't care enough about the game. So yes, I'm with you on Tennessee. I had another kind of semi joke about that too. And for just to preface, I have no problem with anyone to gets tattoos you go crazy i not, I not don't, for, my, i'm not a tattoo guy i'm not I don't, a tattoo I don't guy. i'm not going for them i'm my not wife going has to, two of them so yeah i'm not going to get them but if you are go crazy what i what i for me though my joke is i think i said it to you one week when we were on the road for a road game i was like i feel like he has uh, more tattoos every week like it just feels like he keeps getting them so i was like and then he keeps throwing interceptions so i was like i think he gets a tattoo per interception he's He's like the the basketball player that in college had no tats, and then they get to the NBA, and it's like, oh, he's got a couple tats now, and then they get that next contract, and it's like, oh, he's got all the tattoos now. Uh, yeah. That's kind of what Carson Beck is yep. right now. Cincinnati, Iowa State, under. Everyone's going to be like, what, under? Cincinnati has a really good passing game. Iowa State's defense hasn't stopped anyone in like a month. Uh, all of a sudden, they can't defend. But I think that could be a slower game. I do think Iowa State's defense steps up. I think they have a. This is a pride game for the Iowa State defense. Like I, I have a hard time thinking that they will play terrible. Yeah. I mean, was it Jim Heacock, John Heacock, whatever for you know, for this long? Um, and Cincinnati is a good defense up front, so I give I, I have some respect for what they have up front. And Kansas State's going to have to play that in about a week as well. So under fifty three. 
don't feel as confident about that one as I do the others. But uh, there, like I said, there wasn't a lot to like on the board this week. Yeah, I think if you're, I think if you're doing anything with the Cincinnati Iowa State game, that's probably the way that it plays out. Iowa State's just been really good at, for the most part, kind of mucking things up at home. Um, and so it, this feels like probably like a you know a 24 21 type game if yeah. it's close if if it's not close then it's because Iowa State's run away with this thing and Cincinnati's not scoring right so. Iowa State scored a lot I will say I don't know that I would I wouldn't bet it but I think a, a third straight Iowa State loss is on the table uh, I, yeah I would not rule it out not at all uh line for that game is Iowa State minus Ooh. seven and a half. Uh, which takes us into the Big 12 scoreboard right now. Look around the rest of the Big 12. Um, we kind of just talked about Iowa State-Cincinnati there, but I, I have all the same thoughts as you on that game. Now, first game of the week in the Big 12 is actually tonight on Friday, 9-15 on FS1. I'll probably watch it because i got nothing better to do. Right. Houston and Arizona uh, from Tucson. Are the Cougars probably. still fighting for bowl eligibility, and Arizona, quite frankly, they still are too, which is impressive. <laughs> uh, and the Wildcats, if they can find some magic, I don't think they can because they look like a team that's given up. But they have a manageable schedule left. It's Houston at TCU, and then uh, they play for the Territorial Cup at home against Arizona State. So it would be possible for them. Houston, they need two wins. Uh, they get at Arizona, Baylor, and then at BYU. So they have to win tonight and next week, pretty much, if you want a chance at it. If you're Houston, our, our pal Drew is he, he's a big believer. Oh, he is adamant on Houston <laughs> winning this game tonight. Which uh, I'll be honest, because Houston's already won three or four. That's why I kind of doubt because because you have to be kind of talented to win four or five. Like, yes. and they're not. So this feels like the game where their talent catches up with them because at some point, also on the flip side, Houston, you're so talented that at some point you're so talented you're not going to lose every game as well. So this just feels like uh, the the regression to the norm game for both sides to me. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. I'm, I'm getting a, a quick temperature check. Oh, my gosh. Okay, here's the problem. Uh, somebody explain to me in a quick way. Uh, this It doesn't matter because of how things are working. For some reason, right now on my computer, every time I go to AccuWeather, it has everything set to Celsius instead of Fahrenheit when I'm trying to look at, I have no idea why it's like this. So I'm not even going to bother. I was going to look at weather, make sure it wasn't going to be, you know, raining the entire it's game. I doubt it is. Is it Tucson? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tucson. Uh, no rain. Tuxen. Okay. No, All right. No well then, uh, no, if might throw for a thousand yards, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we'll it's not raining. Houston loses. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. Next day in the big 12, another interesting start time with some teams out around the mountain area and west of that. Oh, Colorado playing at 10 a.m. Colorado playing a home kick at 10 a.m. Deion Sanders did all of that bitching about <laughs> playing late kicks at home. And so Colorado and Fox are like, well, hey, let's just do big noon from, from the Big 12 and uh, kick off at 10 a.m. So they host 4-5 and five Utah at home tomorrow. The Buffaloes minus 11. We know that K-State and a numerous amount of other teams in the Big 12 are begging for a Colorado loss. Any chance that Utah can do it tomorrow? First off, I want to say it is funny, and I know we've complained about it to an extent too. All these teams have shifted and went realignment and gone to different leagues, basically seeking additional television revenue money, right? Colorado essentially did that. That's why they're in the Big 12 now. And um, all the teams that went to the Big 10, all the teams that went to the SEC, and now they're all bitching about what time they play. It's like you wanted all that money to lose that freedom to make that choice. Well, and it's very funny that the Big 12 and the Big 10 have opposite complaints of each other. The Big 10 <laughs> has schools complaining about playing at 11 a.m. Ohio State, yeah. Yeah, and Big 12 like, schools are like, we'd love to play at 11 a.m. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and and most of it's Ohio State because Fox has that big has the 11 a.m. Big 10 game, and they're basically saying, well, we're just going to pick Ohio State every week because they get so much ratings. So Ohio State's stuck playing a lot of home games at 11, and the fans hate it because it hurts their atmosphere. Another thing, too, it's like 11 a.m. hurting your atmosphere. Be louder. Make it good. I don't know. Like, they're, <laughs> like yeah. you're, you're really going to be that dull of an environment to say that, you know, you can make it good. Yeah, night game has does a lot of heavy lifting for atmosphere. We were at BYU. We were at Colorado. 
but I mean, you could, you could do more with 11 a.m. That's a yeah. It, that I don't know. That's just. I think it's because at night it, you can't see anything else, so it feels like you're you only have that one little area there, and so you've got all and that. And everybody does those, those, which has become cliche, the light shows. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. The the LED lights have ruined sporting events across the country. I know that. I think that's why I hate Nike. It's the most. I mean, yeah, we, it's we, get, like, we get to see everybody's LED light show. Uh, I think the manner in which Utah lost last week, uh, in dramatic fashion. And then all of the antics afterwards from the athletic director, the coach, yeah. it just feels like that was a last gasp to me. So I don't think Colorado has any problems this week. I was going to say, you don't think that fires the boys up and they, they want to go out there and play for Mark that Harlan? Could It just seems like, ah, oh, that was the one we wanted. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it that def, you're right. That definitely <laughs> seems like that was their version of, hey, all of our eggs are in this basket here. And yep. we are trying to win the Holy War. Uh, three o'clock tomorrow, ESPN two, Baylor, West Virginia, the Bears, two point favorites on the road with our boy. Th these two guys, the biggest Sawyer Robertson fans in the country since day one. Tricky spot for them. I I probably lean West Virginia here. This is a true coin flip game. The winner of this is going to finish very, very well in a Big 12 issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Especially West Virginia got a nice win uh, on the road at Cincinnati last week. Speaking of uh road games and teams trying to pick up nice wins that give them a chance at being bowl eligible the kansas jayhawks get to experience a 9 15 kickoff in provo this week at 8 15 out there byu only two and a half point favorites at home against ku who is one of those three and six teams that can try and tell themselves we might have a chance at making a bowl game if we get this thing rolling Honestly, I think KU is the only team out of the bunch that has a realistic chance at three and six to do it because they are playing like kind of the team we expected right now. But that environment might just be too much for them tomorrow night against BYU. Unless BYU is due to finally get bitten by the snake that they keep playing with. Uh, a couple of things here. The two and a half, the line of two and a half kind of makes sense because of how KU's played games this year. But boy, that it's the disrespect. The, the books just disrespect BYU every week. Uh, I would think, uh, and I, I, I to a to a point, I get it because of how they do it is just not like how you're supposed to be able to do it. But man, I, I would start to lean into that BYU number a little bit more if I was the books. Uh, but hey, but they know what they're doing with their money more than I do. So looking at the game, Kansas. They they still – I don't expect this to be a blowout. I do expect it to be close. And Kansas hasn't won a close game this year, so I just imagine they lose much like they've lost all year. Even the K-State game in between their blowout wins over Houston and Iowa State was a game that they basically yeah. coughed away when Jalen Daniels fumbled in midfield, right? So it just feels like the way BYU wins and the way KU loses, like that, there should be a hellacious finish. Yeah. You're absolutely right about that, and it's yeah, it's a it's a great point because all signs indicate these two teams like to play the exact same game, just the opposite of each other, with what? the outcome, yeah. and it favors BYU. So yeah, yeah, it one likes to win with miracles, one likes to lose with miracles. Yeah. So yeah, all right, I'm I'm sold. Uh, Cougars minus two and a half. There you go. That's an extra play for it. Oh, probably win by one or two, actually. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. Let's get back in on K State, Arizona State. Uh, real quick, you can share uh, what your your best bet for the Cats and Sun Devils is. It was K State to cover. We've kind of been hinting at it. I think the formula is there for a convincing Kansas State win, and to do that, they will have to run the ball. So if we're going offensive player. I don't know if that was the question yet, but I'll go DJ Giddens because you got always the ball. question. Yep. All right. I, I I like that. Um, let's see here. Uh, I was going to, I was going to try and do something real zany for mine, but then, uh, it was going to involve field goals. I was like, Arizona state sucks at those. DJ Gibbs so, rushing touchdown. Um, maybe, I mean, if, if you want to try and find some, some value somewhere, uh, to get a little bit crazy with it. Uh, I, I won't, I'm going to, to look at this game as a situation where K state, we we haven't seen the the tight end touchdowns as much uh, lately, so I think that it's gonna it's gonna pick back up. Um, 
give me Garrett Oakley to score a touchdown in the game at plus 220. I think that he finds the end zone against Arizona State. It feels like the right move, especially since the Sun Devils are so good against the run that when they get down there, they will probably try to sell out a little bit against the run. The K-State's offensive line has had struggles, um, but I, Connor Riley has been great all season at kind of baiting teams and getting those tight ends wide open. Now, in terms of who I think this game comes down to, I'm not as confident that the run game gets back going in a significant way for K-State. So I think that this game is on Avery Johnson. When you come off a bad loss and you need to, to get this thing moving in the right direction, no matter the age or experience level of your quarterback, they have to lead your team. Avery Johnson has to go out there, has to be clean, get things done, and set the tone for K-State, which I think he can do because before the rain came down in Houston, I liked a lot of the way that he was throwing the football. You think maybe there were some misses there, but also he threw a touchdown on the first drive of the game, and Chase Brown was running out of bounds for him. That cost them. He had a great touchdown throw to Keegan Johnson in the game. He had some other passes that were really precise and nice. I like the way things have been going with Avery Johnson, but he's got to carry K-State out of a bad loss and uh, take care of Arizona State at home. So give me Avery Johnson if the Cats get this thing done. Yeah, I, I hope I'm right about the running game. We'll see. I, I think DJ is due. You got a bye week to kind of yep. solve the issues there. And Arizona State, RJ Harvey did run all over him last week. Yeah, good point. Uh, defensively in this game, Kind of an interesting team with Arizona State. So who has to step up on defense in a game like this? I'm going to say Austin Moore. It's kind of a box game when Cam Scadaboo's the other running or the other running back, and he really runs through tackles. And when it comes to a physicality for this team and leadership and all that, the toughness, Austin Moore kind of sets the tone. Um, tack, I'll say Austin Moore, but just in general, if they tackle, they win. I think. Yeah. Uh, for me, there's only one guy that should really beat you in the Arizona State receiving group, uh, and that would be Jordan Tyson. So this game, to me, comes down to somebody in the secondary because I think K-State can lock in on Scadaboo in the run game a little bit to, to slow it down. So whoever you want to throw out there, but you look at how bad some of the other guys have been, um, you're probably relying on Jacob Parrish throughout this game to, to make sure that Tyson isn't involved in a big way, which – he, he has been going off recently. If you look at uh, his recent games, he's had at least five catches and 75 yards in the last five games that Arizona State has played. So there's a little bit of Tedero McMillan there where you may not be able to do anything other than just hope that nobody else gets theirs. Uh, but I think that one or the other, you have to shut down Tyson or Scadaboo because if you let both of them do their thing, they're gonna they're going to be in this game and have a chance to win it. So... Uh, give me, give me Parrish just to take one of the DBs to step up. But I don't know. We think we think one of the safeties gets a, a pick in this game. I, I I had half a mind to go VJ Payne just because he has been a playmaker this year. Uh, yeah, you're right. Forcing fumbles, getting picks, getting the clutch tackle. Uh, I I think Marcus Siegel has been fine this year. I think Jacob Parrish has been really solid. But I think VJ Payne's came up with the big plays when they needed it the most. Yeah, VJ Payne has been the big play guy. Basically, him and Austin Romaine are involved in or all Jack the big Fabric. plays. <laughs> Jack Fabrish, yeah. Uh, so we'll see. All right. Well, we know what you're going with. You got the Cats to cover. So what is your final score here? Yeah, again, I think there's a formula here for a convincing win. Kansas State off a loss is pretty good under Chris Kleiman. They had the bye week to kind of fix some issues. They're really good at home. Um, I think that they played a tough schedule uh, in relative to maybe some of the other teams in the Big 12 to where they are tested for a game like this. I don't know that Arizona State is tested for a game like this. I don't know that Arizona State has played in an environment like this yeah. this year, too, so that'll be interesting. Most of these players, maybe all these players, none of them have probably played a game at Bill Snyder Family Stadium. Also something to consider. Um, a lot of things working in Kansas State's favor here. Arizona State, not only do I think their record is kind of a product of who they have played this year and who they have not, but I think some of these metrics when we're saying, well, maybe they're a good run defense or maybe they're a good run offense is also a product of who they have played this year. So some of those are inflated. And I think, I think everything comes back down crashing to earth. Like I said, usually if you're not a top five or a top 10 team in general in college football, you're always going to have one dud a year. Arizona State hasn't necessarily had that dud, even though they lost close games to Texas Tech and Cincinnati. So I think this could be... 
get away from the Sun Devils. Uh, and I hope I'm right because uh, I need something a little bit more stress free than what we've yeah. seen lately. So I'll go 35 20 K State. Yo, are you kidding me? There's no way. Is that There's, your score? I mean, dude, I have it written down right there. <laughs> I, hey. I've had this written down since I did Power Cat Game Day on What's a. Uh, we can go to the books and pick exact score, right? Oh, yeah, there you go. That's the that is the new official best bet of the week on KSO uh, 35 to 20, uh, with a missed PAT from Arizona State. Yes, and I think not kicking field goals. And I think it's a late Arizona State score. I mean, I think it might be like 35 14, and yeah. then they score at the end of the game, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then do the analytics play and they go for two and don't get it. So, yeah, that could uh, be it too because Kenny Dillingham would do that, yep. Uh, yeah, I look, I I'm, I'm really in line with the logic you have in this game. Um, you, you look at all what you talked about, the toughest road environment they've played in this year was their game at Texas tech. Um, and that game, look, I, the Lubbock environment that every time I've been there and I've been there multiple times now has been pretty underwhelming and yeah, I've been there for it, night it, games. So they play there at a two 30 in the afternoon when, er, and when Texas tech was like, struggling like that wasn't texas tech getting things figured out yet yeah and, and it's also and again this sounds like disrespect it's not meant to but if you're a tech student or a lifelong tech fan and, you, and you're like arizona state's coming to town you're like oh this is the one we get up for that's not it yeah uh and then a couple of other things to try and make you feel better Probably the two most comparable running teams to k-state that arizona state has yeah. played this year hey, you. Um, Texas Tech started – Taj Brooks ran for 117 yards on them. Only 4.3 yards of carry. He had 27 of them in the game, but still decent day. KU had a nice night running the football. Devin Neal was 14 for 71, averaged over five yards of carry. Daniel Hyshaw was 10 for 48. Jalen Daniels added some in there as well. Uh, and then, like you just said, UCF last week, um, had a strong night. R.J. Harvey was 25 for 127 and three touchdowns throughout the game. So you have that they have struggled against the better running backs in the league this year. And Sam Levitt, if we're talking about the environment that they're about to play in, he played in four games at Michigan State last year. Three of them were at home against Maryland, Michigan, and Nebraska. The only road game he played in was a 15-point loss in Minnesota. That's where he attempted his most passes last year as a Michigan State quarterback. He was 8 of 12 throughout so he absolutely has not played in an environment like bill snyder family stadium at night all the reason why we already talked about it because dy stole my pick but the cats are going to win this thing 35 to 20 as long as they as long as it doesn't pour or snow and they don't play like idiots those are the three caveats with k-state football if any of those three happen then arizona state could win this game it feels like Yeah, I would say it feels like more like Arizona and Oklahoma State than it does KU. It's a good way to look at it. All right. <laughs> I was trying to look at the last few home guys. Like, man, K State hasn't played at home very. Yeah, much. you know, the, it's it's really it's it's a weird schedule this year that K State has played. I was like, uh, where, where's the home games? Yeah, no. yeah, we've we've only seen four home games, and they've been spread out by like a month every time that they've been played. So. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll see how it goes for K-State tomorrow night. We'll have full coverage for you over on On3, kstateonline.com, with all the written stuff leading up to the game during and after. And then you can also head over to the KSO YouTube page where we will have the instant reaction and immediately have Chris Kleiman's post-game press conference up for everybody as well. And if you want to get into what happened in basketball last night, we have a bunch of content from that also. So, that will do it for us today. For Derek Young, I'm Mason Vo. Thank you for listening and watching the KSO Show. We will uh, be back again next week with a, a loaded slate of everything as K-State heads into the home stretch of the football season. Also, a Sunday show coming your way this weekend. So we are out of here. We'll talk to you again tomorrow.